Welcome back everyone, I'm Jordan Giesecke, and this is The Limiting Factor. This is part 10 of the Lithium Mine to Battery Line series, to break down and understand what was unveiled at Tesla Battery Day. Today we'll be doing a deep dive into the hardcore engineering challenges of the high nickel, cobalt-free cathode that Tesla unveiled at Battery Day. Before we begin, a special thanks to my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. This is the support that gives me the freedom to avoid chasing the algorithm and sponsors, and I hope will eventually allow me to do this full time. The links for support are in the description. Back to cathode engineering. Let's start with a quick recap of the last video. Batteries are made of alternating layers of active materials, current collectors, and separators. Each of these layers is thinner than a human hair. The cathode active material is made of crystals that are the size of a red blood cell. Within those crystals is the atomic structure. The atomic structure is a layered material that alternates between transition metal slabs and lithium slabs. The transition metals provide a structure that allows the lithium ions to enter and exit the cathode crystals when the battery charges and discharges. By using different metals in the transition metal slab, it can make the crystal structure stronger or weaker. Some metals, like cobalt, are able to make the crystal structure stronger by holding the atoms around the cobalt more tightly. On the flip side, cobalt also holds on to some of the lithium ions and doesn't allow them to enter and exit the crystal structure, which reduces energy density. Nickel, on the other hand, makes the crystal structure weaker because it holds the atoms around itself less tightly. Nickel holds the crystal structure so weakly that it will actually fall into the lithium layer permanently. This takes up space that would otherwise be held by lithium and is called cation mixing. However, the weak bonding of nickel also has a benefit. It allows more lithium to enter and exit the crystal structure, which means more lithium is available to store and release energy. In other words, a pure nickel cathode is desirable because it stores more lithium on its first charge cycle, but that storage capacity quickly fades. A pure cobalt cathode is desirable for cycle life, but doesn't hold as much energy. This creates an obvious question and a clear engineering challenge. How do we get most of the benefits of nickel and cobalt without the drawbacks of either? The answer is dopants. By adding small amounts of elements to dope the cathode crystal, it can have a massive effect on performance. On screen are three different doping ratios. NCA is nickel doped with cobalt and aluminum. NCM is nickel doped with cobalt and manganese. NCMA is nickel doped with cobalt, aluminum, and manganese. I've extracted some of the key data points on these three chemistries and they're shown on screen. As you can see, the energy density is nearly identical, but with the right mix of dopants, cycle life actually increases with decreasing cobalt. If you're wondering why these numbers appear so much worse than what you'd expect from a Tesla vehicle, there are a number of reasons. The first to jump out at me is the depth of discharge, which is 100%. 100% depth of discharge rapidly degrades battery life compared to the shallower discharge and charge cycles that batteries usually experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Many companies and researchers have analyzed Tesla cells, and in the past they were, as expected, NCA. Additionally, one German teardown from 2018 indicated cobalt at 2.8% at the cell level. The cathode makes up about 31% of the battery cell. This means 2.8% cobalt at the cell level is 9% cobalt at the cathode level. That is, Tesla's chemistry in 2018 was using a chemistry similar to the NCA89 chemistry we see here, which is 10% cobalt and 1.5% aluminum. With that in mind, the NCMA89 looks enticing. Tesla could make nearly double the batteries with the same amount of cobalt because NCMA89 uses 5% cobalt instead of the 9% Tesla is probably currently using. This is important because cobalt is twice the cost of nickel and comes with a raft of environmental and human rights concerns. Not only would NCMA use less cobalt, it might also provide significantly longer cycle life. Although this chemistry wouldn't be as durable as what the media has dubbed the Million Mile Battery from Jeff Don's lab, depending on the pack size, 
it might be capable of a million miles in real-world conditions. However, it's difficult to tell from this image alone. The cycle life of NCMA for Tesla would depend on factors like the cathode and electrolyte pairing. There are reports that Tesla is already planning to purchase NCMA batteries from LG Chem, which was reported in late December. These would likely be for the China Model 3 and Y. My view is that Panasonic may soon follow suit, and I suspect that the reason why Tesla noted NCMA in their battery day slide is because this is what most long-range Tesla vehicles will be using for at least the next couple of years. NCMA is a great step forward and might use about half the cobalt of Tesla's current chemistry, but the real prize is a high nickel cobalt-free chemistry. I've seen very little data on cathodes that are completely cobalt-free. In this paper by Hong Yong Li and Jeff Don, there appears to be an explanation of why there is little data on high nickel cobalt free chemistries. There was an assumption in the research community that cobalt was required for high nickel chemistries, but that assumption was based on outdated methodology and data. Early synthesis methods for high nickel cathodes resulted in cation mixing. As a reminder, cation mixing is when nickel enters the lithium layer and blocks lithium storage. Cation mixing would have reduced the performance of the early high nickel cobalt free cathodes and made it appear that the cobalt was more important for structure than it actually is. In other words, no one had tested the theory that cobalt is required for high nickel cathodes with modern synthesis methods. If most researchers assumed that cobalt is required based on outdated data, it may explain why I've seen few research papers using high nickel, cobalt-free cathodes. This research paper is why I suggested in my original Battery Day predictions videos that Tesla could go with an NA9505 chemistry, composed of 95% nickel and 5% aluminum. NA9505 seemed like a logical progression from NCA. Looking at it now with fresh eyes, it's clear to me that the purpose of this research paper was to prove that cobalt isn't required in long cycle life batteries, rather than to begin optimizing and selecting specific doping ratios for a cobalt-free chemistry, which are two different things. The broad methodology was that aluminum, magnesium, manganese, and cobalt dopants were added in 5% increments to several test cells. Equal amounts of each dopant were used in each test cell to generate a fair comparison. 5% increments of the dopants were used. This was probably to ensure that the effects of the different dopants were large enough to make the differences between the test cells clear. If the purpose of the research paper had been to find the optimal mix of dopants for a high nickel, cobalt free cathode, the increments would have been smaller than 5%. As we saw with NCMA, even a dash of dopants such as aluminum at 1.5% can make a chemistry much more robust. If the research paper had been geared towards optimizing and selecting candidates for a production pathway, the increments would have likely been more like 1%. Jeff Don's research group concluded in this paper that although cobalt helps provide structure, it isn't required. Other doping elements like aluminum may provide even more structure than cobalt. This puts to rest the idea that cobalt is required in cathodes. The next challenge is to increase the amount of nickel in the cathode to above 90%. This is because nickel maximizes the amount of energy a cathode can store. Time to get into the hardcore cathode engineering I promised in the intro. Conventional cathode particles are polycrystal structures. The individual crystals are called primary particles, and the spherical conglomerate of primary particles is called the secondary particle. So far, we've only talked about the cation mixing that can occur within the primary particles, but not how those primary particles interact as a larger spherical secondary particle. As a battery charges and discharges, the primary particles expand and contract. If this expansion and contraction is large enough, the secondary particle begins to disintegrate, which reduces battery cycle life. The expansion and contraction happens for two reasons. The first is due to phase transitions. Phase transitions are changes in the cathode crystal structure that occur when a battery charges and discharges. Each time lithium is inserted or removed from the cathode crystal, it changes the electrical charges of the atoms within the crystal structure and their orientation within the crystal. 
It's a concept that left me gobsmacked when I first learned about it, because it illustrates just how dynamic batteries are at the atomic level. It may not look like anything is happening when you charge or discharge a battery, but if you were able to shrink yourself down small enough, you'd see what looks like a living, breathing thing. The stronger these phase transitions are, the more the primary particles expand and contract during charge and discharge. Again, doping with elements such as manganese and aluminum can stabilize the crystal structure to reduce the phase transitions. The second reason for expansion and contraction is that as lithium enters and exits the primary particle, the crystal structure must expand and contract to accommodate that additional lithium. High nickel cathodes allow more lithium to enter and exit the primary particles, which means they expand and contract more, which means more degradation. Our next engineering challenge should now be clear. Even if the doping is effective at reducing phase transitions and cation mixing, Higher nickel contents mean greater expansion and contraction that drives the secondary particles to shatter. Let's look at the engineering options to accommodate this expansion and contraction stress. The first option is a microstructure cathode. In the image we see on screen, boron was used to dope the cathode material. The NCM90 we see on top is a typical polycrystal cathode structure. The particles are arranged haphazardly. This means when they expand and contract, they push against each other and fracture the cathode particle. The B1.0 NCM90 is doped with 1% boron, and just that small amount of doping has caused the primary particles to form into needle-shaped crystals that radiate from the center outwards. This means that when the crystals expand, the highly organized needle-shaped crystals reduce cracking by distributing the expansion stresses over a larger area. In the regular NCM90, we see point-to-point -point areas of extreme stress, which would cause fractures at those locations. The second option is the single crystal cathode I've spoken of so many times before. With a single crystal cathode, large primary particles are used and there's no secondary particle structure. There are no other crystals to push against and therefore no fracture points. It's a very first principle solution. However, Single crystal cathode may cost about 2 to 3 percent more than standard cathode material because the synthesis of single crystals requires higher temperatures. Next is a gradient cathode. Gradient in this case is short for concentration gradient. Conventional cathode particles have a homogeneous ratio of elements throughout the primary and secondary particles. This means that if you sampled any part of the cathode particle, the ratio of elements like nickel, cobalt, and manganese would be the same. A concentration gradient means the ratio of elements at the core is different from the ratio at the surface. For example, the illustration on screen shows a high-energy nickel core and a stable manganese shell. A concentration gradient cathode can have a similar effect as the microstructure cathode. It can align the crystals to reduce expansion stresses, which extends cycle life. Second, elements that are very stable against the electrolyte can be concentrated in the shell. This would have a similar effect to applying a protective coating. That is, it may reduce reactivity with the electrolyte, increase cycle life, and improve thermal stability. There are several types of concentration gradients that have been developed. Each of them appears to be more effective than the last, but also more complex than the last. Although each type of concentration gradient uses standard cathode production equipment, the processes for their synthesis appear to be more complex than the other particle engineering methods we're reviewing here. This complex synthesis might lead to higher production costs. The last option is a heterostructure cathode. A heterostructure cathode is similar to the gradient cathode in that there is a core and a shell. In this case, the primary difference between the core and the shell isn't the concentration gradient of the elements. It's the arrangement of the atoms within the individual crystals. The image on screen shows electron microscope images of a crystal structure. If you look closely, you can see individual atoms. There are also thumbnails that illustrate how those atoms are arranged in both the core and the shell. As with the concentration gradient core shell structure, the shell increases the stability against the electrolyte much like a protective coating would, which in turn increases thermal stability and cycle life. 
This coating effect doesn't explain how the heterostructure cathode prevents cracking caused by expansion and contraction. The paper cites an answer for this, which is a reduction in a specific type of phase transition that occurs at 4.2 to 4.3 volts, which would reduce expansion and contraction. However, tungsten may have another impact here that's not stated. Other research papers noted that tungsten reduces the size of the primary particles. I've lined up several images here so you can see the differences between the primary crystal grains of each cathode material. First, the typical chunky crystal grains of an NCA cathode. Next, a cathode doped with tungsten. Finally, the radial, needle-like pattern of the boron microstructure cathode. As you can see, the tungsten cathode in the middle has a small primary particle size. These small crystals help to distribute expansion stresses by increasing the surface area of the crystals. This in turn reduces cracking and increases cycle life. With these four engineering options in mind, how do we decide between them? I see several ways to refine our choice. The first is to attempt to make a link with Jeff Don, Tesla's research partner. The second is to look at all the research, compare the performance, and select a preferred option. The third is to look at the crystal structure in Tesla's battery day slide. Let's start with the Jeff Don link. In the last video, I said that Jeff Don's team made references to the types of coatings and dopants that could be paired with a cobalt-free cathode. Both those references appeared to be for heterostructure cathodes. This is promising for the tungsten-doped heterostructure cathode. It's also worth noting that the words here say appropriate coatings or low levels of dopants at the surface. Low levels of dopants at the surface would align with a gradient structure like the tungsten heterostructure cathode. The next way to make a decision on a cathode material is by using this table, which shows a summary of cathode tests from multiple research papers where the amount of nickel was greater than 90%. For reference, we can see the NCMA-89 chemistry I mentioned earlier in the video. Tesla stated that their new cathode material could achieve a 4% range improvement. A 4% range improvement would be roughly a 3.5% improvement in energy density at the pack level, which would be roughly 9% at the cathode material level. This would put our target specific capacity at 245 milliamp hours per gram. 245 milliamp hours per gram isn't possible because it would require pure lithium nickel oxide, which has terrible cycle life. If a 9% energy density increase isn't possible with specific capacity alone, this means that there's something else baked into Tesla's 4% range increase. It may be that in addition to a cathode material with a higher specific capacity, Tesla further increased the energy density by slightly increasing the voltage from 4.2 to 4.3 volts. This in itself could create a 4% range improvement. The chemistries here were tested from 2.7 volts to 4.3 volts, which is 0.1 volt higher than what Tesla currently uses. As noted above, the tungsten cathode is particularly good at taming the phase transition that occurs at 4.2 to 4.3 volts. That phase transition is why most batteries are limited to 4.2 volts. The third lens we have for trying to pick a chemistry is electron microscope images. Battery manufacturers don't often release electron microscope images because of what it can reveal to competitors. The shape, size, and orientation of the crystals provides a lot of information that can shed light on a manufacturer's process. It's worth noting that different elements can have similar effects on crystal structure, so using visual cues isn't really scientific. Rather, it can provide clues. It's also worth noting that Tesla only provided us a pie-shaped quadrant of their particle rather than an image of the full particle. With these caveats in mind, let's read the tea leaves. First, compared to a standard NCA cathode, we can see that the crystal structure is hugely different. The standard cathode contains large, chunky crystals. Tesla's cathode contains a greater number of small and irregular-shaped but elongated crystals that radiate somewhat from a central point. Next, the boron-doped microstructure cathode. This time, the crystal structure is again vastly different, but to the opposite extreme. The boron-doped cathode contains primary crystals that are even more elongated and radial. 
but the thickness is about right. However, there is more than one type of microstructure cathode. Tungsten can also be used to create a microstructure cathode. Depending on how the cathode particles are synthesized, tungsten doping can be used to create microstructure or heterostructure cathodes. As a reminder, a heterostructure cathode is one where the crystal structure in the core is different than the crystal structure in the shell. A tungsten microstructure cathode is what we see on screen. As you can see, this is looking more promising. Small, thin crystals extend somewhat radially from the core. There even appears to be a white film on the surface. It's not as pronounced as Tesla's particle, but still visible. Next is the concentration gradient core shell structure. This one is more difficult because the electron microscope image is low fidelity. If we were to go by the illustration, Tesla's particle is clearly different. This is where a fuller view of Tesla's cathode would have helped. A better look at the core of Tesla's particle would show the crystal structure and might help us out. However, I'm ruling out the gradient cathode based on the illustration. Finally, the heterostructure tungsten doped cathode. Again, the electron microscope image isn't as clear here. In my view, the crystals here are about the right size and shape. Once again, as with the tungsten microstructure particle, there appears to be a white film on the surface of the particle. The film is pronounced here and on par with Tesla's particle. While we're on the topic of coatings, there appears to be two ways to create a protective surface on a cathode particle. The first is by a dedicated coating. A dedicated coating prevents the cathode from reacting with the electrolyte. The drawback is that it wouldn't store energy and would be dead weight, which would reduce energy density. The other option is that much like the heterostructure cathode and the core shell gradient cathode, the doping would naturally provide a protective surface. That protective surface provides some energy storage benefits and also prevents reactions with the electrolyte. Furthermore, Jeff Don's team has found that coatings may not even be needed with the right electrolyte. All this leads me to the conclusion that Tesla may be able to avoid dedicated coatings, and so I won't do a deep dive into coating methods and types in this video. Let's stop for a quick review. We've discussed how the right combination of dopants in the crystal structure can keep nickel atoms from popping out of place and dropping into the lithium layer in a process called cation mixing. We also discussed phase transitions and the accompanying expansion that can occur. We discussed how high nickel cathodes can result in even larger volume changes due to the greater amounts of lithium entering and exiting the crystal structure. Finally, we discussed the engineering solutions that may be required to accommodate the expansion and contraction caused by the phase transitions and lithium entering and leaving the crystal structure. Next, we looked at the different ways we might gain insights into what Tesla decided to use in their cathodes. First, Jeff Don's team dropped a possible hint in the cobalt-free cathode paper by referencing heterostructure cathodes, including tungsten heterostructures. Next, we looked at a table of research results that shows the thermal stability, energy density, and cycle life of various cathodes. Finally, we looked at images of cathode materials to see the impact of different doping elements on secondary cathode particle structures. Let's pull this symphony together and speculate on what it all means. Tesla's slides state that they're using novel coatings and dopants. Novel generally means that the chemistry hasn't been evaluated in research papers or published in patents. I'm going to assume that this is true and that none of the chemistries in this table are what Tesla will be using. To create a cathode, our first task is to minimize phase transitions that may cause expansion and contraction in the primary crystals of the polycrystal material. We also need to reduce cation mixing of the nickel structure into the lithium layer. Manganese and aluminum look like the best non-cobalt candidates for this. In fact, a combination of the two seems to have a synergistic effect, as we can see with NCMA versus NCA and NCM. Our second task is to create the right polycrystal structure to accommodate expansion and contraction stresses. Although I don't like the idea of using tungsten due to the weight and cost, it appears to outperform every other dopant in terms of retaining energy density and extending cycle life. For example, 1% weight of the tungsten in the cathode appears to be as potent as 10% weight of other dopants.
There are two ways to use tungsten. It can be used to create a microstructure cathode where the tungsten is doped evenly throughout the crystal structure, or it can be used to create a heterostructure cathode where the tungsten is loaded at the surface of the particle to create a shell. This shell would be made of a crystal structure that's stable against the electrolyte. It would have a similar effect to a dedicated coating. This heterostructure cathode would be my preference. The image from battery day of Tesla's cathode is roughly in line with what we'd see in a tungsten microstructure cathode or a tungsten heterostructure cathode. There appears to be a protective layer on the surface of the particle. Although the protective layer could be a dedicated coating, a dedicated coating might reduce energy density. Tesla might be able to avoid this energy density loss by going with a hetero or microstructure cathode where a protective coating naturally arises from the doping agent. The image also shows relatively small secondary particles, which would reduce expansion and contraction stresses. This would again fit with a cathode containing tungsten and may rule out concentration gradient cathodes. It's difficult to say because the image Tesla has provided is incomplete, and also because the images from the research papers are lower resolution. This makes an apples-to-apples -apples comparison difficult. Finally, Jeff Don referenced a tungsten-doped heterostructure cathode as a promising option. The other heterostructure cathode he mentioned used a cobalt-doped material to alter the crystal structure, and so I threw that option out. That doesn't mean that Tesla hasn't developed a cobalt-free and tungsten-free heterostructure cathode. I just haven't seen any research to support this. Let's go back to our table and see if we can find a tungsten-based heterostructure cathode that also contains manganese or aluminum and see how it performed. I've highlighted here an NCM90 cathode that's been doped with 1% tungsten. It has good thermal stability and has roughly the same specific capacity as Tesla's current cathode material. If we look at the capacity retention at 100 cycles, it thrashes the NCMA89 and it's the best on the table at 97.5%. I think Tesla can do better than equaling the specific capacity of NCMA, keep the cycle life benefits, and remove the cobalt by finding a middle ground between two chemistries on this table. The 1% tungsten and LNO has good cycle life and a specific capacity 6% higher than Tesla's current cathode. However, it has a thermal stability 10 to 15 degrees lower than Tesla's current cathode. If Tesla could find a middle ground between the NCM90 plus 1% tungsten and the 1% tungsten LNO, they might be onto a winner. For example, Tesla could remove cobalt from the NCM90 and 1% tungsten cathode, add 1% aluminum, and it might hit the sweet spot. That is, 94% nickel, 4% manganese, 1% aluminum, and 1% tungsten could potentially have a 2% increase in specific capacity, roughly the same thermal stability, and comparable cycle life to NCMA, but it would be cobalt-free. That's just a wild guess, and it's unlikely I've nailed it here. But it's the type of approach that makes sense from the information we've reviewed today. As I was finishing up this video, I found a research paper that wasn't captured in our table of options because it was published just before the paper that contained this table. Shout out to Battery Bits for highlighting it in their year in review, and Andrew Wang from Intercalation Station for bringing it to my attention. The paper used what they referred to as an NMA89 cathode, shown here in gray which was roughly 88% nickel and 6% each of aluminum and manganese. In terms of cycle life, it outperforms a standard NCA chemistry, which is in pink. However, the specific capacity of the material is about 5% lower than NCA. Furthermore, the NMA89 was only cycled to 4.2 volts rather than 4.3 volts, and so I'm not sure how it would cope with higher voltages. If Tesla could stabilize this tungsten-free chemistry to 4.3 volts and raise the specific capacity, it would be my preferred option. But I don't have the data, and I don't see a clear pathway to hit Tesla's 4% range increase with this NMA chemistry.
There were no cross-sectional images of the secondary crystal structure in the paper, but my understanding is that high amounts of aluminum in the NMA chemistry could potentially be synthesized to form microstructure cathodes, which might look similar to what Tesla showed at Battery Day. Hopefully, Tesla has found a more abundant element than tungsten, or a mix of elements that I'm not seeing in the research. Even if they don't, a win is a win. Tungsten appears to be a much better choice than cobalt. It may be roughly the same price, but it's difficult to tell because I couldn't find an exchange that it was tracked on. Tungsten doesn't have the negative connotations of cobalt because it's not known for being produced by child labor in the DRC. Most tungsten is produced in China, which is better but not preferable. However, that's changing. There's a major resource coming online in South Korea in the next couple of years. Global production of tungsten is less than cobalt, but much less would be needed. Even advanced chemistries use at least 5% cobalt, whereas a tungsten chemistry would use 1% or less. I'm eager to see what turns up when analysts start tearing apart the 4680 cobalt-free battery cell to once again find out where I was wrong and where I was right. Regardless, I hope this video provides some insights into the grueling numbers game Tesla is playing here, where a 1% change in lithium-ion batteries at the materials level can squeeze out a 4% range increase and eliminate a controversial material from Tesla's supply chain. A nickel-rich, cobalt-free cathode would put some hard-won points on the scoreboard for batteries, and is the culmination of decades of research. I often hear, well, that seems easy, why isn't everyone doing it? As Elon has said, things are easy in hindsight, and in my view, that's particularly relevant when talking about chemistry. As always, the harder part is then making millions of cells a day that are composed of materials as small as a red blood cell that are built into layers thinner than a human hair. The volumes involved here mean a cobalt-free chemistry has global ramifications to the battery supply chain, which has been dependent on cobalt for over 30 years. Although we're only looking at going from 5% to 0% cobalt at the cathode level, that will be tens of thousands of tons of material per year when we hit terawatt production scales. Even 5% is unsustainable with cobalt and the way cobalt is sourced. A cobalt-free cathode is the only way forward if we want to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. Any cycle life and energy density benefits would be win-win and beyond expectations, which is Tesla's modus operandi, and I'm betting they've pulled off again here. In the next video, we'll talk about the three cathode options Tesla presented at Battery Day. It'll be a nice break from the mind-breaking engineering and trade-off decisions we've discussed in this video. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon with the link at the end of the video or snag something off the merch shelf below. I'm also active on Twitter and Reddit. You can find the details of those in the description, and I look forward to hearing from you. A special thanks to Tyson Wilmot, Jim Knapp, Niall Tucker, Froman Anderson, Johan Kasuma, Mark Barb, Mal Cohen, Brad Turner, and Adrian for your generous support of the channel, my YouTube members, and all the other patrons listed in the credits. I appreciate all of your support, and thanks for tuning in.